For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and culturally. Deep in the abyss of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other-than-human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistakes. I invite you to go with me down the rabbit hole as I seek out the silenced, forgotten, buried, abandoned, and demonized stories and practices of regenerative, egalitarian, place-based cultures. There is still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationships to the land where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Hello, and welcome to the Rewilding Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Michael Bauer. I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon, the traditional territory of the Multnomah and Clackamas Chinookan people, as well as the Kalapuya, Malala, Cowlitz, and many other tribal groups who have lived here, subsisted here, and traveled here to trade and make their living since time immemorial. This podcast is produced in partnership with Rewild Portland, a nonprofit organization, and is made possible through financial support from our listeners. The best way to keep the podcast going is to become a recurring monthly supporter. If you feel inspired to contribute, you can make a donation by following the link in the podcast notes. You can also help by sharing our podcast on social media and writing us a review on iTunes. Before proceeding, I want to give a content and trigger warning for some dialogue around sexual assault as well as discussion around gender and sexuality. I was born with a penis, assigned male at birth, and was socialized as a man. Growing up, I never felt that who I was and wanted to be matched with what was being projected onto me as so-called masculinity. I'm not queer or trans. I use he, him pronouns and identify as male. I do not have gender dysphoria. I'm just a man who rejects the narratives of masculinity created by civilization. I was able to learn how to perform many of the characteristics of what people called masculinity well enough to blend in with my peers. I was shown and told that men were not supposed to have empathy. I remember around the age of nine, teaching myself to close off my sense of empathy, joining in with my male friends in the senseless murder of countless helpless ants just for the sake of entertainment. I remember the constant homophobic emasculation done to me and by me on others as a way of affirming our own so-called masculinity. Culture tells us that many of the traits it has created are evolutionary, ingrained, and essential, yet my own existence, as well as many others, proves that they are not. While violence is not entirely absent from immediate return hunter-gatherer societies, They are one of the most egalitarian and gender-balanced societies ever to be observed. Since that way of life is theorized to be the environment in which we evolved, it means that our social nature is much more malleable and that the way humans live their lives can greatly impact their behaviors. Not only are we capable of egalitarian or socially just and equal societies, it was most likely our baseline for at least 150 to 200,000 years. If we don't match up with what our culture says we should be like, where did this mythology come from? How is it hurting the members of culture, of all genders and sex? Where and when did the mythology that, quote, real men are violent competitors, or as some social Darwinists have even claimed, demonic by nature, come from? What are the implications of a cultural masculinity steeped in competition and harmful violence? And what does masculinity look like through a rewilding lens? Today I am interviewing Dr. Martha McCoy, professor of sociology at Appalachian State University and author of the book The Caveman Mystique. Not only did this book clue me into many fascinating ideas around contemporary masculinity and its origins, it is also a treatise in understanding cultural transmission in the scientific age, how an idea can trickle down from scientific research through the filter of pop cultural narratives and into an embodied mythology that is enacted in the real world. Her book was very impactful on me, and I'm indebted to her for writing it. It forever changed many of my perspectives on rewilding, evolution, masculinity, 
and analysis of cultural narratives. I've been wanting to connect with her for years. It is with great excitement that I'm happy to introduce Dr. Martha McCoy to the rewilding community. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Glad to talk to you. Yeah. I've been wanting to connect with you for a long time after reading your book a couple years ago and just being like, I mean, it really reframed a lot of the ways that I think about and also teach what I call rewilding. I found your work because I was teaching a class called Rewilding 101, and then people wanted me to do one that was more geared toward social and environmental justice around rewilding. And I think I must have Googled like feminism paleo diet or something. I don't remember exactly what it was, <laughs> but yeah, um, I found an article that I think it was called Caveman Masculinity that was then linked to your book. And then I was like, oh, this looks really great. And I read it and I was just like, wow, this is changing not just the concepts around, you know, masculinity and sort of the social Darwinist um, ideas around that, but also just like the structure of understanding scientific research and how that is then turned into pop culture. And then that is turned into embodied and lived mythologies. I just really love that, the way that you set that up when you presented the... Um, the guy in Central Park who said, like, welcome back to caveman times. Oh, and thank how you. you were able to, like, make that linkage. I was just like, whoa, that's amazing. And so that's kind of like been one of my focuses is trying to understand those threads that connect, you know, lived embodied mythology with like where the stories are coming from and who's constructing them and what are our biases around them. So I think it was just a really, really great book. And I'm really happy to have you on the show. <laughs> Well, and I want to hear more about re rewilding too, because I assume that part of it is about how men can embrace a new masculinity without thinking they're brutish cavemen who can't help but sexually assault women, right? Yes. So, and there must be better mythologies out there that you could embody than the caveman mythology. <laughs> totally. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, just the word wild itself carries connotations of inherent violence like wild and crazy, uh, you know, that, that kind mm -hmm. of idea of, for example, the, you know, rewilding, one of the definitions is undoing domestication. And the Nazis did this experiment where they wanted to recreate the auroch, which is the wild ancestor of the domesticated cow. And so because their concept of wild came from this idea of survival of the fittest, thinking domination and strength, they created a cow through selective breeding that looked like an auroch, but was just really mean, <laughs> oh. which is not how wildness works. That's not how evolution works. You know, they so the idea of rewilding being trying to understand what wildness actually is um, was how I came across your book and, and the mm -hmm. idea of being able to expand that definition and understand where these myths of dominance and inherently violent males in wildness come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, and that, that part you mentioned in my book about the guys who were engaging in sexual assault in the central park and that outdoor parade or festival that was happening that, that who's and one of them is caught on video saying, welcome back to the caveman times while he's attacking this woman who's, you know, sobbing and trying right. to get away. When I saw that, on TV, that's when I said, that's what my book is about. Yeah. And that's why I have to write the yeah. book because the sort of idea for those men who do think that they're cavemen or some have some sort of deep seated essence that is this brutish, uh, sexually aggressive being and that somehow got bred into them. And again, I think that is a kind of mythology, but totally. for them who think this, it really can have lived behavioral consequences. So it, it does matter what kind of mythologies we're going to live by. And they do become embodied beliefs, like, and they feel like second nature. So that's, totally. that's been a, a real interest of mine because when I, before I wrote The Caveman Mystique, I wrote this book on, based on my study of the women's self defense movement. And it seems so strange, and a lot of people have asked me, how could you have gone from writing a book about the women's self-defense movement to a book about men who think they're cavemen? And I said, well, they're really both books about how gender gets embodied as a, as a lived ideology. Totally. Because 
here were women in a self-defense class. And I went to a whole bunch of those classes as a participant observer and saw this over and over where women had to unlearn some of the feminine socialization yes. they had developed. And it was, it was a set of bodily habits, right? They mm -hmm. didn't know how to uh, kick or punch with their full physical ability or force. They giggled and apologized if they, if they did have mm -hmm. to hit or push someone or set a boundary. So these weren't things that were uh, natural, essential delicacies totally. that are part of the X chromosomes or anything. These were the socially instilled, embedded into the, at the, into the bodily habits of these women, that these were ideologies embedded into their lived habits. And so it seemed actually, it really made sense to me to look at a sort of another side of that coin that there are men who develop a set of beliefs about what it means to be a man. And then this feels real and it's equally embodied in the same way that a sort of feminine comportment is embodied in many women. And it can be unlearned. I saw that in the self-defense classes. And I mm -hmm. hope that men are thinking about uh, more reflexively uh, ways they can unlearn some of those traditional scripts and think more consciously about what mythologies they want to embody or what it means to them to to be a man and not uh, sort of swallow whole those uh, narratives that are in popular culture about men being cavemen. Yeah. In your research, you know, what's the line between nature and nurture in that regard? Like, do you think that there is an inherent aspect to sex biology and how it then is portrayed culturally and gender? Or like, maybe we could start with just like, what is the caveman mystique? Well, so the caveman mystique as sort of playful term I use to describe this attitude or feeling or sensibility that a man might have that he's deep down a caveman. And of course, that itself involves a set of assumptions, right? The, the assumption is that the caveman is uh, maybe a bit dorky and not very sophisticated, mm -hmm. not very emotional, not very intelligent and not very sensitive and certainly not very feminist or egalitarian mm -hmm. or democratic in his relationships or dealings with women in particular. Um, that So the idea that you're a caveman and that this is a, a way that you relate to people and this is how you understand your sexuality. Yep. So the caveman mystique is just this idea that even if you believe that you have this set of biological drives that dates back to our you know ancestral human males who must have been sexually aggressive um, the, the thought goes even if you believe that and think well therefore i need to control those drives or this biological original sin if you will um that there's still a kind of caveman mystique. I and mean, so you could have the caveman mystique and embrace that caveman and just say, hey, welcome to the caveman times. This is how I am. Or you could you could be very careful to make sure that you act to keep those caveman impulses in check. But in a way, that's still the caveman totally. mystique. Too. This idea of that that's how one is. Um, and it's interesting because that caveman mystique being a belief that if you're a guy, you can't really be expected to behave in a way that is egalitarian and sensitive and so forth. And so you, if you look through popular culture, there are so many references to the caveman that indicates that this is what it means to be a caveman. Like there's the caveman's pregnancy companion, which is a book that oh is God. marketed to men who have partners who are pregnant. And so the idea is that if it's the caveman's pregnancy companion, the idea is that this is going to be the most basic information because of course you cannot possibly have a very, uh, even a clue about um, supporting a partner who's pregnant or helping raise a baby. And so the, the kind of advice the pregnant pregnancy, the caveman's pregnancy companion gives men is is really things that are really basic like, now that your partner's pregnant with your baby, 
it might be a good time to stop texting back and forth with your old girlfriend. She's probably <laughs> feeling sensitive and needy right now. So, I mean, they wow. really do treat the reader like, yeah. like the quote unquote caveman right. who would have no clue. So in a way, I, it's so insulting to men. Totally. I mean, I don't know any men who are that bad, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe they're out yeah. there, but I mean, it's, it, it's, in a way, it's good that a man wants to read a book about things he can help prepare when he's expecting a baby. But I, I just don't think they need such basic information. Totally. And uh, but it, but there, obviously, there's some market for this. There, there's some group of men out there who apparently somehow take comfort in the idea that they really are basic, if you will, <laughs> and they right. really can't be expected to behave in egalitarian ways. And, uh, and that's one of the things that had puzzled me. What, why would anybody take comfort in that narrative about themselves? Because to me, it seems so insulting. Right. Um, and yet it did seem to be comforting in some ways. And you didn't hear a lot of men complain when Muscle and Fitness Magazine and Men's Fitness Magazine and Men's Health Magazine and all these pu publications, Playboy and so forth, told men they were really cavemen deep mm -hmm. down. They, they weren't writing letters to the editor saying, I, I resent your depiction of masculinity. I'm far more egalitarian <laughs> than that. And for some reason, this seemed to take hold. And I could only, I could only make sense of it in that sociological context of what had been happening to men economically, which was a real economic decline. American men weren't doing as well by the 2000s as they had been doing 10 and 15 years before. Um, in real in real dollars, like when you control for the cost of living, men on average were making less money than they were making a decade prior. And so there, there was an economic decline, there was mass unemployment, and there were also um, losses of the particular kinds of jobs that American men were more likely to hold as compared to American women, like manufacturing jobs. And those were going overseas. And so even when men weren't unemployed, they were working in jobs that felt like they were beneath them and that didn't require the same kind of um, physical strength that some of the jobs that American men had in the past mm -hmm. required. So, and they weren't doing jobs that helped make America run. And so it was a, they were in the service sector. And so just like with the feminine mystique, Betty Friedan's famous phrase from her book that launched the women's movement in the late sixties, she argued that what women in popular culture were fed, that they shouldn't want a better life for themselves, including a career and equality. They should take pleasure in their Tupperware collection and their fingernail polish and their fancy hairdos and whatever, and, and whatever dinner parties they were able to host and so forth. The feminine mystique was this kind of mythology about how that really, it wasn't very satisfying. I feel like the caveman mystique is a sort of bogus line of crap that um, men are supposed to feel fulfilled doing when really they don't find their current role the way that caveman mystique is a kind of um, cheap substitute or a, they're supposed to glom up to feel like they're real men, even though it isn't what men used to do to feel like they were real men. And we could we could talk later about why anyone needs to feel like a real man. But <laughs> it makes me think about uh, a couple of years ago, you know, me personally, I was born socialized male. I identify as male, use he, him pronouns. I've never really felt any sort of inkling towards any of the like forms of masculinity that I've seen presented or that have been sort of shoved down my throat. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the, so it's always perplexed me, the idea of living up to some standard of, of a form of masculinity. But it's clearly, and, and, I, and I feel comfortable in myself um, for who I am, and I don't really feel the need to kind of live up to some other standard or, or exactly kind of what you said of like what it is to be a real man. I, I, you know, a large part of that was probably that I was raised by all women who just didn't have any of those things that they were projecting mm -hmm. on me, or at least, you know, mm -hmm. that I was aware of. I'm sure there was like, you know, male privilege, unconscious bias things that they were raising me with that they were unconscious of as well. But 
I started to jump into this a little bit more after reading your book and just kind of looking around at what other people kind of in a similar vein are doing in this regard, especially around like men's groups and things like that. And there was like a couple of these websites that I go to that I that are these, you know, self-help gurus of masculinity in a sense. And they use these, you know, there was one guy in particular who's clearly like affected a, a deeper voice than he actually has. <laughs> and, you know, he's a big bodybuilder and he he's like, you know, I've searched the world to find, you know, the the four things that all men have in common. And it's you know, <laughs> courage and power and strength and, you know, all these different things. And I was like, none of those actually apply to men. Like, I think women or any gender or any, you know, sex would feel good if they were strong and had courage and felt good in their body. You know what I mean? I'm like, so what the yeah. hell is this guy even talking about? Like, and, and why is that? you know, why is that held up as this thing? So I just really, and again, I think most of it is coming through the lens of, of reading your book and kind of understanding more about this kind of thing. But one of the things that I'm curious about too, is your perspective on like in, in your book, you talk about how this was brought about a lot in regard to the economic decline of men in the United States. But I'm also curious about just like the innateness of this meme, if you will, the stickiness of the caveman mystique that has been here for a lot longer of a time frame. Um, and I think about like, you know, um, I teach a class called Myths of Prehistory. And one of the I have a bingo sheet that I hand out um, for people to check boxes throughout the class that they see out in the real world of the myths of prehistory. And one of them is inherently violent males. And, mm. you know, I, over the years, I have people send me images and stuff that they find or that they see around cavemen and things like that. And one of the prevailing ones is this idea of the caveman hitting the woman over the head with a club and dragging her back to his cave, right. which is like implied rape. Everywhere, yeah. And it's, that, that image is everywhere, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I, I literally have a folder full of over like 25 different cartoons of the same thing. And so mm -hmm. it's just weird to see it perpetuated for this length of time and probably much longer than what we are even... You know, I mean, I imagine it goes back to Darwin's theory of evolution in that era, but also even before that of just like the rise of patriarchy throughout civilization. I'm wondering, like, how much the caveman mystique plays into this idea of natural patri patriarchy within, you know, social Darwinism. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, that, but it's also interesting how it used to be that the most privileged men did not want to identify as animalistic mm. or as related mm. to uh, non-human primates, right? The privileged white men justified or rationalized, I should say, rationalized their power and privilege and their subjugation of enslaved Africans by saying that it was those enslaved African males and animals and were, you know, not as evolved or as civilized as, totally. as they, the white men were. And so it's interesting to me that the the discourse really shifted at a certain yeah. point so it's i think yeah. it ha it's more slippery and shifting than we often think but i don't know because i didn't actually study that whole long history mm -hmm. um i did i did look at the reactions to darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection and that's where i found a lot of people a lot of white men who wrote letters back and forth to Darwin who were freaking out at what they thought were the implications of Darwin's theory. So at that point, in the mid 1800s, they did not want to think of themselves as cavemen. Oh, no. <laughs> they right. were like, are you kidding? You know, and that was um, so there were different circumstances back then that where, you know, they thought they were above all of that. And so it's interesting now that, um, it would be a way to defend your privilege in a way right? <laughs> and, and justify patriarchy. But I think patriarchy at a certain point in history may have been justified or rationalized on the grounds that um, men were above the men who were in charge, the, the specific patriarchs were sort of above all of that and that it was women and people of color who were closer to nature and sort of needed to be ruled over. And so, right. I, I don't know. That, that's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, it makes me think of, um, are you familiar with Daniel Quinn's work? No. 
he wrote this book and in it he kind of talks about some of the larger cultural mythology that we have uh, especially around like religions and evolution and things and one of the things that he talks about is like a fundamental premise of civilization is that we think we have the one right way to live but then also look at ourselves as flawed creatures and so i wonder how much of that has to do with like um you know and then which is where like the idea of sin comes in like we're just flawed we we're sinners and we have to repent or whatever in order to um but i i think about that in regard to like being a an idea prior to evolution and then maybe the idea that you know that that we came from australopiths and hunter gatherers and things like that it was a way of like circumventing around and kind of that that same idea of like well we pulled ourselves out of the muck but we're still uh, you know, and, and we're we're civilizing ourselves, but inherently we're still this way. And that's why things are the way they are today. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I'm sure that is how people, some people think of it mm-hmm. for sure. And, and that's, you know, and I, I've also wondered too, if, you know, do we, do we have to let go of a kind of mythology of the caveman if someone can em- embrace it or embody it in a way that is has a kind of ironic humor attached to it (laughs) rather than a kind of mean spirited attempt to justify keeping things patriarchal. So I think that that that's interesting too, Mm -hmm. just like Mm -hmm. what is the reason someone wants to cling to an identity? Yeah. I I could handle it if it was a kind of comedic, ironic stance. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So that makes me come back to that other question, which is like, in, in looking at all this stuff, did you ever see like anything that you would think of as innate in regard to like human nature? Because essentially, mm-hmm. you know, it seems like that's really what's at stake here is like looking at humans and trying to understand what, if any, there is of a, of a nature behind our actions or behaviors. Well, as a sociologist, that wasn't my question, actually. I didn't think what it's all about is to see if there is a sum innate nature that that is or if there, there's any sort of common natural essence that all humans have or that all human males have i think that's certainly a question of the evolutionary psychologists especially any differences between human males and human females they're real interested in that question but as a sociologist i'm always interested in the question about the variability and about the impact culture has so even if you say it's it's a nature of a tomato to to be red, but it starts off green and it turns red in the sun. So this may be a bad analogy, but as a sociologist, I'm really interested in the process totally. of how the tomato gets the sun and then what happens and how long it takes some tomatoes to turn red. Now, some are still green because they weren't in the sun. And, and the, so sociologists are so interested in all of the different environmental factors that shape, even if you think of it as in nature, what kind of nature comes out. And so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm so interested in the, the social institutions and um, the, the social forces that shape and reshape whatever nature we have. That doesn't mean I think everything is nurture and there's no nature. It's just that I'm interested in the nurture oriented questions. I'm, I'm interested in, how people think of themselves and how and and how social institutions impact their opportunities and how they'll think of themselves and express themselves so to me i've just not been interested in uncovering that but i think that our colleagues in evolutionary psychology are very interested in that question and and i don't think it's a bad question to ask and you know that that's what they make their business to ask and i think there's been a lot of sort of turf war between the the psychologists and the biologists who are interested in evolutionary Mm -hmm. explanations of men and women, and then like the sociologists and the feminist scholars in various humanities and social sciences, because we, we do take a different approach, but in a way, I don't think that they have to be at odds with each other. And I think there's some evolutionary psychologists who've said there are feminist evolutionary psychologists. These don't have to be um, opposing views. And I agree but I guess, but in the end, I think even where evolutionary psychologists would say, you know, well, but but we, sh- we should make sure we listen to the evolutionary theorists because they can come up with the real 
solutions to the problems because they'll learn the real causes. And I guess I'm not that worried about yeah. what the real cause is because at some level, if there are, if there are say um, men sexually assaulting women, and we know, we know that men get assaulted as well and that some women assault. So, but by and large, the overwhelming um, problem is male on female sexual assault in terms of the problem of sexual assault. So let's just say men sexually assaulting women. If we agree that's a problem, it, it doesn't really matter if the evolutionary theorists explanation of what causes that behavior is closer to the empirical truth or if the feminist explanation is closer to the empirical truth because we all have the same solution anyway, which is social engineering. Yeah. We all believe in changing the situation to keep those guys from doing it. Right. So, so in the end, I guess I don't really care. I mean, don't care. I mean, I'm yeah. interested, <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't actually change how you would solve the problem. I haven't heard any evolutionary scholars talk about, you know, giving men shots or changing their <laughs> hormones. They, they don't talk, they don't have any other right. solutions that are different from any of the ones that my colleagues in sociology or in women's studies would come up with, which are things like teach people about prevention, teach women and girls how to defend themselves, show the importance of an egalitarian view of relationships emphasize the democratization of intimacy. And these things tend to reduce the problem of sexual assault. So I guess in the end, I feel like I'd, ra I'd like to step out of that nature versus nurture kind of war and the evolutionary scholars versus feminism and say, well, what, what are we all trying to achieve? And in practical terms, if you're not a scholar trying to get published, you're either a guy who wants to have a more fulfilled life or think more critically about what it means to be a man or have better relationships or whatever might, you know, be your motivation for studying or thinking about gender. Um, and that would be the same if you're a woman to be thinking about that. And that that's really a different question. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that taking a one versus the other approach will will give you better answers to those general life questions. Yeah. But maybe I'm just, you know, I don't know. Feel free to no, disagree. I think that. that's great. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I mean, for me, I'm always kind of looking at both and trying to understand how they interact, but it, mm -hmm. it's, you're totally right in the sense that like, uh, social engineering is essentially what everybody's doing anyway. It makes me think of like epigenetics now and how, you know, genes are one thing, but how they get expressed is how you live your life. So, you know, oh, yeah. and again, it's the same kind of thing where how do you, you can't change your genes necessarily, but you can change how they are expressed by changing your environment, um, you know, through diets and other things, stress reduction, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's interesting. It makes me think too of, there's a book called The Egalitarians, Human and Chimpanzee. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's, yeah. it's this woman who studied um, with Jane Goodall and realized that most of Jane Goodall's research that she was publishing for her books was not including the first five years of her research with the chimpanzees. And so she asked her if she could look at the first five years. And within looking at the first five years, there was a lot less data there because as she found out, she asked Jane, like, how come there's such little um, data here? And Jane was like, well, because back then I didn't use feeding stations and I had to follow the chimpanzees through the forest, which was really challenging. And then also I had to set up blinds where I could sit and watch them, but they are constantly migrating around. So it was hard for me to like actually get a lot of data. But when she looked at that data set, she realized that, that the behavior of the chimpanzees was much more egalitarian and there was a, a minimized amount of violence. Even in Jane's own notes, after she created the feeding stations, she says things like, I can't believe how much more violence I've seen since I've created these feeding stations. She attributed it to the more data that she was collecting in a sense. And so this other woman then went and looked at all these other studies of chimpanzees that had been done prior to feeding station research. And again, across the board, it was a very different behavior than what they were seeing after. And as soon as Jane Goodall started doing the um, feeding stations, because of the amount of data she was gathering, like everybody else that was studying chimpanzees switched over to that method too. <laughs> and so, oh my God. yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> and it, and it comes down to this thing of like, you know, 
And so she compares and contrasts the behavior of the chimpanzees prior to the feeding stations and after with immediate return hunter gatherers and delayed return society in regards to what we know and have observed through like the more egalitarian um, relationships that that immediate return hunter gatherers have without a lot of food storage or the need for food storage. And it's a very similar comparison. It just makes me think about, I don't know where to go from there in terms of you know social engineering, but um, mm. you know, thinking about if violence can be reduced through environment and it has it doesn't really necessarily matter if we're going to equate ourselves, you know, with our relatives in the in the ape world, which isn't necessarily um, scientific in, in and of itself in that way. But the people do that, you know, they're like, well, we're like chimpanzees because and chimpanzees, we all know, are super violent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Except for the bon Bonobo apes. Right. So there's this there's that they're always used as the, the peaceful example. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. We could be either one. We're like you. And there's this back and forth. But maybe the reality is that the environment that a lot of these researchers created with chimpanzees increased their quote unquote natural violence, mm -hmm. um, you know? Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. So, so we're already in studying their natural environment. We're shaping and reshaping that environment. And then a, a totally different chimpanzee nature gets expressed exactly. and because of the alteration in the environment. So yeah. And that, that kind of thing is what fascinates me as a sociologist is how the, the different atmospheres and environments you set up will lead to different behavior. And, and every, I mean, I guess I say everyone knows it, but like you said, with health matters, you, you uh, have a genetic propensity for something, but you actually might as a result, take better care of yourself because you find out you have a genetic propensity totally. for some kind of illness than someone else who doesn't have the genetic propensity or, or we know that, you know, depending on the layout of your city or that you live in or your town you live in, you may get more exercise versus less, less exercise. Um, just depends on how, whether there are bike paths and walking paths where you live or, mm -hmm. or if you're stuck in a car culture and you're, you never get to walk. And so I feel like there are, there are things that structure our environment that change uh, how we behave and and what we're likely to do. So, and yeah. we know I mean, there's there's studies that show what what makes people cheat on tests and, and what curbs that tendency. And so, I mean, there's there's all kinds of things. But you know, you could say, okay, well then, to cheat or to be lazy and not exercise are human nature. But what makes us <laughs> get up and exercise and what makes mm -hmm. us avoid cheating. And you, you could say that, but again, I think, I think that's, that's what's interesting. And I think that even the evolutionary psychologists would say that um, humans are incredibly flexible and adaptive, but um, I don't think they would say we're not, but they're still fascinated with whatever remnant left over from those, days, the cave days, if you will, the environment of evolutionary adaptedness where humans, human nature did evolve. What, what was that setting and what, what nature that evolved there is still being expressed today. And it may be that there's just a little bit of it, but the evolutionary psychologists are really interested in that little bit or in, in that part, right? So when there was a study that came out, this was years ago, but it, it was a fun study they did a it went around the world and asked men and women, what are you looking for in a mate? And they asked for the top three qualities, like, you know, quit. They didn't give people a lot of time to think. <laughs> and and men and women both had the same top two. The same top two were kindness and sense of humor. Hmm. And so men and women were both looking for people who were funny and nice, right? <laughs> kindness and sense of humor. That's great. It was only their number three where they differed. And there was a tendency for women to talk more about someone with resources and men were more likely to put beauty as their in their number three spot. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind, funny and rich, kind, funny and beautiful. <laughs> or like, you know, whatever. Um, I might be, you know, rich might not have been how they put yeah, it. Sure. But yeah. The answer was, you know, a resource provision. Um, but so, but even then, so for some of the evolutionary psychologists, that was evidence that despite the similarities men and women have, they there also is still some, maybe some expression of that human nature that would be different 
different in women than it is in men because of that environment we were adapted to where, you know, women can only have so many children and there's a huge uh, resource commitment when they get pregnant, not only through eight to nine months of gestation, but all that time breastfeeding an infant who is extremely dependent, right? They're not totally. like a little giraffe that after being born is like running around. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like they're, they're, you know, they're practically ready to go get their own apartment yeah. in then six <laughs> months, right? So like yeah. our, our children as humans, because of our huge brain that takes so long to grow and develop it, it outside of the womb, like it continues to grow and develop our, our human infants are so dependent that there's a humongous amount of um, resource investment from the parent and that's the mother typically, but, but that, and of course men could stop if they wanted to, and our ancestral men could have technically stopped at just contributing the sperm. Right. And then they would have had a child possibly, even if they didn't do anything else. But so I think they figure that that difference in the reproductive roles that human males and females had throughout evolutionary history mean that we might have different, we might have evolved different wants and needs and desires. There's not exactly like fossil evidence of any of these desires or, or if there's a psychology that really is innate, we don't have any hard evidence of that, but they have studies like these mate selection studies and they think that provides the evidence and it might, but I still find it fascinating that we can't sort that out or we can't separate out what they found from the reality that most women don't have as much money as most men. So if women were all like Madonna and Cher and Oprah, like completely wealthy, they might not, they might not put resources in their number three spot. They might put beauty in their number three spot. I don't know. So I feel like we, we still can't sort out all of the social causes of our desires from the biological ones. Totally. So I feel like the evolutionary psychologists liked that study because they did find somewhat of a difference between men and women. Um, But again, you could explain that difference between men and women based on just socioeconomic trends. Totally. So, um, and also it's the, the whole, like, who were they asking to, like, if they went around, were they still just asking like the quote unquote weird population, the, I forget what it's, what the weird acronym stands for, but it's like Western educated industrial, um, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> something dem- democratic, yeah. um, they uh, did know, go it makes around, me wonder though. like what the sample size and, and diversity was in regards to that too. Yeah. But also it makes me think of like, you know, it makes me think of the part in your book and correct me for what I'm, you know, I'll probably butcher it. But the idea being that, you know, a lot of evolutionary scientists look at homosexuality as like a fluke or something they don't understand because in theory, everything is about gene production for them. So if you're homosexual, you're not going to reproduce a gene because you're not going to have kids or something along those lines. And so it baffles them. But my understanding of what you presented was that there are potentially multiple reasons evolutionarily why being homosexual would be just a part of it or that being Mm -hmm. bisexual innately might make more sense in some regard as well. And that perceiving people as, you know, default straight is a bias that these scientists are looking at. And I I wonder about that with this question of sexuality in the same kind of way where I'm wondering, um, like if there's a, if there's a default thought behind um, the context in which sexual, uh, you know, sex and gender, like a default family unit perception or something like that. I don't know what I'm trying to say. (laughs) Well, you mean it, is the is the way they think about um, families throughout our evolutionary history itself heterocentrist? Yes. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think they. Um, I might not be answering what you wanted me to, so if not, That's tell okay. me. <laughs> but it. Um, but yeah, I think that the the whole um, assumption that we project onto our past is based on what we think of as a relationship or as a as a family unit today, and so we have to 
be careful about assuming that, um, you know, in the cave days, uh, there were, um, there was like the cave dad, the cave mom and two and a half kids (laughs) like that. That would be kind of silly. Although, you know, there's a hilarious movie where Nicolas Cage plays the caveman dad who tells stories about the kid. I I forget the name of the movie now, but it's, it's hilarious, but they do do that almost on purpose. sort of like the Flintstones where they, they project every possible thing about, you know, mid-century American domestic life onto the Stone Age, yeah. <laughs> even though it's in a way it's so over the top that it's obviously a joke. Totally. But, so I feel like um, we I think we can be more careful than that. But I think there is a way in which a lot of people, not necessarily the scientists or the evolutionary psychologists, but a lot of just regular people tend to have replaced a Judeo-Christian narrative about sexuality with the supposedly scientific understanding of um, human sexuality and an evolutionary account. But it has, for some people, simply the evolutionary account has replaced a Judeo-Christian account. And so they still privilege heterosexuality instead of saying, you know, well, our creator doesn't like the idea that a man and a, you know, there would be any any combination other than a man and a woman. Our, the creator designed a woman to be the helpmate of a man. And that people used to talk that way when they wanted to talk about why being gay was bad. Right. They would say, the creator, and if God had intended, and there's right. even old recordings of people saying that. They're hilarious, although they're they're, they're not hilarious uh, in the sense of that they really did do totally. terrible damage right. to, but they're by today's gay rights standards, they're, they're hilarious in, because they're so absurd, right. but they, um, people, even religious people today wouldn't say that by and large. Um, but people now, um, have started to say, you know, since say the seventies and eighties, they've started to say, well, um, it's just not natural. There's no way humans would have evolved if they had partaken in a homosexual sex. So we know all our ancestors were straight, right. you know. And so that just still also projects this idea that identity works the way it does today. And we and we've already challenged this view with gender fluid, gender queer, and gender non-binary and queer identities. Um, but you know, even the idea that you're either one or the other, straight or gay, and that you you only prefer one gender group as your sexual partner or your or your romantic interest, and that's the one you stick with your whole life. That that's already been challenged recently totally. again by gender yeah. queer and um, and others. But the idea that um, you know we we can't imagine that a caveman could have been bisexual or polyamorous or gender fluid or queer right like why right. why can't we imagine that right. so um you know it, that that certainly could have put his genes into the population right so and in fact you could even make a case that that would be um that would have been the more adaptive um sexual orientation if you will so I think we have to, it's just a, it's a good lesson in being mm-hmm. careful about all of our assumptions, whether it's the assumption that everybody's straight or that there were like little cave nuclear families or that we, um, that we have these stable sexual identities that revolve around the gender of our object choice. I mean, that, that itself yeah. is an interesting assumption. So totally. um, then there are all these studies like the gay brain study, the gay twin study and the. Um, There's one other one on the gay gene. Um, And so these all sort of attempted to find the root, quote unquote, cause of homosexuality. And and again, that on the one hand, some people were hopeful that if you could establish that being gay is innate, you could protect it legally and it would help the cause for gay rights. But other people were like, well, what if I'm gay, but I don't have that gene? Yeah. Or what if I, you know, or my, my brain is the same as a straight person's brain, it turns out, but I'm still gay. Do <laughs> right. I not get the rights, right? That that would be ridiculous. Yeah. So it's still, it was still based on this idea that everybody is in these distinct categories rather than that these identities are actually socially constructed and fluid and vary across time and across different cultures. So um, those 
those evolutionary theories that try to explain um, uniquely modern Western identities is they're they're kind of off track, I think, mm-hmm. because they're they're not these natural stable identities in the first place. So totally, yeah, yeah. So I guess in in that question that they asked in regard to like what do you find, you know, what are the top three qualities in a mate? It would be interesting if you know, I'm wondering if they only surveyed quote unquote straight people and, you know, what the difference would be in more uh, expanding that idea more across the board. Yeah. Well, and then what, and then what would that tell us? I mean, it would be interesting to say like, what, what would that help us find out? Sure. I mean, and there have been some evolutionary scholars have, um, designed some studies to look at the different mating habits, if you will, of gay men compared to lesbian women. And um, there there are more um, anonymous hookups among uh, male pairs than female pairs. There are, um, there are more um, long-term committed relationships among lesbian women than among gay men. And there's more monogamy among lesbian women than among gay men. And those things evolutionary scholars use to support their claim that some kind of innate set of sexual desires that dates back to the environment of evolutionary adaptedness still drive us. So even if you're gay, you um, are still driven by, if you're a gay man, you're still driven by those male tendencies to have more episodic sexual encounters to be more looks oriented and to have to want to have more encounters with a wider variety of partners and women whether they're straight or gay still have that what they see as an evolutionarily based adapted tendency to want a stable relationship with someone who can help them raise kids. Like that's kind of the, and totally, so yeah. for them, the differences that you find in today's society between male, male couples and female, female couples support their argument. I would say eh, maybe they do, but it, at the same time, you'd still have to look at all the other right. sort of the cultural programming that totally. led to that as well. And, and also the, the different circumstances that, that might lead to, to that, um, whatever patterns those are. And, yeah. and then you'd have to explain the outliers. There's plenty of, there's plenty of male, gay male couples who are monogamous exactly. and who don't cheat on each other or, yeah. or who have, or who aren't polyamorous or, yeah. um, whatever. And, and there, there are women who have one night stands and whatever it's called today. That's an old term, isn't it? One night stand. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Or, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> talking or whatever. So they, I mean, so it's, even then that might be changing as well. And mm-hmm. so there, there are still cultural expectations and cultural allowances that um, are gender specific. And, and so, but again, yeah. and, and maybe, maybe there is some um, evolutionary basis, but, um, but then, okay. Right. I, I'm not opposed to there being an evolutionary basis for some of our behaviors. Right. Yeah. That's, but I, I do think that it's when people go overboard with it and either start using the what they think evolutionary sa- evolutionary theory says to rationalize gay bashing or discrimination against gay people and prioritizing or privileging heterosexuals or rationalizing sexual assault or um, or harassment or even just sort of crass behavior that they think is natural uh, totally. that then I think it's, it's really an abuse of the scholarship. And I don't think the evolutionary scholars ever say, yeah, go ahead. So, you know, I think they're actually quite liberal. I'm sure most, the vast majority of them support gay rights, just like the vast majority of academics across all fields do study show. I mean, academics are pretty liberal and evolutionary scholars, I, I think, are pretty liberal as well. I, I did a study before I did my book and found that, you know, the vast majority of them are uh, identify as liberal and they give they give money to help save the environment. And, you know, they, they have a, they're pretty much the same political social profile that any other professor has. 
So I don't think there are a bunch of, yeah. you know, homophobic <laughs> sex pigs, which right. is what a lot of feminists have said they are, right? I mean, that's a classic case of thinking that their research findings show something about their politics. And I think it is important to separate out your politics from what you're studying as a researcher. And your your research may lead to some finding that is... I don't know, it appears to have um, unpopular political implications, but I'm not sure that, that that means that you shouldn't say what your research findings are, and, a, and it certainly doesn't mean that you agree with whatever those political implications are. So, but it, it's definitely been a, it's been a huge, um, like, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word for the kind of debate or argument over all that stuff. I, and, and I did feel like one of the reasons I wanted to write the book on the caveman mystique was because I did know some of those guys. I knew those evolutionary scholars. I took classes with them when I was in college and in, in graduate school and they're nice, normal people. They're not evil people. And so when I heard my feminist colleagues and friends talk about evolutionary scholars in such negative terms, imputing a set of political motives on them. I thought, wow, like this, this is really a battle that is pretty intense. And I, I felt like I was a good bridge between mm -hmm. the two groups because I didn't feel like I was extremely against either group. Mm -hmm. I was actually felt like I identified with both groups and thought both of them were actually pretty reasonable and my biggest beef is with the popularizers of the scholarship right. because it's the popularizers in Playboy magazine and Men's Fitness magazine that just shamelessly appropriate um, a much more sophisticated scientific study to make to make a point and to almost make an entertaining journalistic news article. Mm -hmm. That that's where I think it's really frustrating, and I wish more scholars did talk about the way journalists and other popularizers kind of abuse their work. And um, I mean, I almost feel like we need like an academic Snopes.com. Isn't that the, <laughs> yes. the fact checking site? Like, I wish we could just plug that in. Like, mm -hmm. Muscle and Fitness said that this evolutionary study revealed, and then Snopes would be like, no, we actually interviewed the real scientist, and that isn't what he said. You know, like, don't right. you wish exactly. there was like some sort of clearing yes. out? Yes. So, I feel like that's that's to me like one of our biggest problems. And now we're in the era of, you know, social media spreading fake news. Right. And so totally. it's really a problem. It's even in a way worse than when I wrote about it yes. in the caveman mystique. Absolutely because way worse. <laughs> you, can't, you can't even like take it back. Like even if someone tries to stop the spread, like somebody who maybe they didn't check it carefully enough, but they post something on their Facebook page or on Twitter and then it, even if they try to go back and say, actually, let me correct that or let me take my my post down because it was it turns out it was wrong or I've now fact checked it. It can be too late. The totally. horse has left the barn. Yes. And next thing you know, there's like a stampede of fake news. Yes. And um, it, so I feel like that's that's our biggest problem totally. yeah. is to maybe we all need to like to stop freaking out and go, okay, what are they really saying? And is right. this, you know, and how, yeah. how careful should I be in assessing that for myself? And that was one of the things I hope that readers would take from my book. Cause Absolutely. I always thought, you know, what if it's just some regular guy reading my book? It's not, no one who's a scholar or anything else, but a regular guy, what, what's the point? And part of the point I thought was, you know, think carefully about, what people say it means to be a man yeah. and decide for yourself and think what it means to you. And also think about the historical and social context, as well as the context of your own biography that shapes who you are. And, and if you can see yourself in sociological terms, then I think there's a kind of flexibility there. Mm -hmm. And and that flexibility is really important in today's economy because the reality is we all do have to change roles a lot. There totally. are people in, in families where it may have started out as this sort of traditional uh, leave it to beaver family. And next thing you know, the 
dad loses his job because of our economy and he's the one who has to stay home with the right. kids and it's and it's his partner who has to go to work and then it switches again or they get yeah. divorced and yeah. someone's a single parent so people really get along a lot better in their families and with their partners when they can show flexibility and grace in the okay. face of all of the changes yeah. that that any given individual and any given family is going to face whether they want to or not and we just don't have the stability that we used to anyway. And so people don't have a lifetime job at the, at the company with a company car and a pension. These are not people have to, people don't stay living in the same geographic region. You know, you're no longer, you, you don't hear people saying, well, I live on my granddaddy's home place, right? right? Like you no, you, you, you're likely to live very far away from your granddaddy's home place mm -hmm. and people, people's mobility uh, is another reason they have to be flexible. So I, I feel like that understanding of yourself can help serve you well if you, for facing today's world anyway. So I kind of just hope that men would take a step back and, and look at the narratives that come at them more critically and also think about, think about their identities and their lives in these more sociological ways with what we in sociology call the sociological imagination where you see everyone is a mixture of historical influences. So, you know, what point in time you live in, social influences, what society or what, what culture you live in, and individual biographical influences, you know, what your dad taught you or right. what your mom taught you or what your siblings uh, modeled for you and, and, and what, what individual bizarre experiences you had and what particular encounters and traumas shaped your own view. And those are all valid. It doesn't mean you need to overcome those things. Those shape who you become. But it's good to recognize those forces. So, sorry, yeah. I feel like well, now I'm sounding awesome. all preachy. No, this is great. This is so great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I One thing that popped into my head when you were talking about, like, you know, a misinformation that then can then spread and then it's too late. The scientist or biologist who coined the term like alpha wolf in his uh -huh. first book, talked about how wolf packs have an alpha and a beta and these different things. And then, you know, he, he'd only been studying wolves for a couple of years. And then after he wrote that book, he realized, oh, actually, there's no such thing as an alpha. And he's literally spent the last 30 years <laughs> writing books about how that's not a thing. But nobody cares, you know, because I think, again, I think there's this thing of, you know, where it's something that I feel like is sticky in the idea. Like, there's something alluring about the power idea, the, the domination idea of an alpha that then becomes mythologized mm -hmm. and held in this thing, even though it's fake. And even though the person who created it has been writing about it for 30 years. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I really appreciate your perspective on asking people to dig deeper and, and look into like sources and actual scientific studies. And I love the idea of there being a, an academic Snopes I feel like that's super necessary right now. But again, then again, it might not even matter for the layperson who's just going to accept the the narratives that they want, you know? Mm. Yeah. And I guess I, I feel like there, again, I still go back to maybe there's a, a, a space for that. Just accept the narrative you want, but then don't impose it on other people. Sure. Like um, my ex-brother-in-law -brother always used to drink um, Bud Light beer. And I remember I was really young. He's much older than me. And, and asking him, well, why do you, how come you always drink Bud Light? And he said, I don't know. I guess because I like the commercial. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was just so hilarious mm -hmm. and refreshing because he wasn't, he wasn't going to pretend to have some sure. deep answer, yeah. right? So, I mean, I guess I, I, could, I could handle it if a man said he, you know, he identified as a caveman because it, it just seemed kind of fun, right? right. Like, but he, yeah. he wouldn't pretend it had the authority of science behind it that explained all men and their inherent nature right. or that all men yeah. have these things yes. in common. Like that, you know, then it, it gets into that, you know, it can almost be a source of cultural bullying at some level. But but if someone is playfully adopting that identity, then it, it's not, I don't think it's any different from adopting any other identity in a, in a culture where identities are seen as fluid and yeah, playful totally. and constructed. 
but it would then lose its force for being objective and um, one that could be imposed on others or a benchmark against other people who don't fit that description or that identity would be measured against, right? We don't want, we don't want to do that. So that would be the difference. But I think there's a lot of possibilities, but it does, it does mean questioning the authority of science. I mean, I believe in science and I believe that humans evolved through natural selection. I'm not a denier of evolution. I'm not a creationist. And I believe that science is sort of the best knowledge we can have. But I think that even that is limited. And we're better off when we have perspectives that come not just from hard sciences, but from the humanities and other fields and the arts, because they can provide us with really important perspectives on gender and identity, for example. So Mm -hmm. I think it still sort of takes an academic village to provide you with the information you need about who you are and what are some good paths for living. Absolutely. Um, Awesome. Did you have any questions for me? Well, yeah, I still, if you don't mind telling me a little more about rewilding, I read a little bit of it on your website, I Mm -hmm. guess, but I am interested in, are there any feminists who are champions of rewilding? And are there any feminists who are like skeptical of it because of what they might fear it means? or what they fear men will do with the idea of rewilding? Yeah, super good question. It's hard to pin down exactly who is using the word rewilding and in what ways. From my perspective of what rewilding means, it's challenging to find people that are like talking about it or using that word to describe the same kind of thing. In that regard, Mm -hmm. I would consider the caveman mystique in the rewilding milieu, <laughs> um, ah. you know, for, from my perspective, looking at it and going, oh, this is highly influential on this overall idea of what it means to be wild or to embrace wildness. There aren't a lot of people using the word rewilding uh, to write about it yet. I mean, it's it's been around as a term for a long time. It was coined by Earth First in the 1980s, as far as I know. Ah. And then branched into sort of two divisions. One was like rewilding and conservation biology, which essentially just meant removing humans and letting a place go, quote unquote, wild without human influence, which to me, that's actually not what wildness is. Um, And it ignores the history of indigenous people and their place in ecosystems as well, especially in in the United States. In that form, the conservation rewilding could be perceived of as racist and uh, even fascist in a way of eliminating indigenous people and erasing their history as part of the places that they're quote unquote conserving. Um, So that's like a huge critique I have on conservation wilding. The other part that where I came into it was through um, what's called primal anarchy or was originally called anarcho-primitivism, which is essentially the idea that the inherent state of humans or rather the state that we evolved in the ma- for the majority of our history was in stateless egalitarian societies that we can see have continued in continuity today to immediate return hunter gatherers. And so mm-hmm. it sort of puts a, it sets the bar there as like, that's the potential for humans. Um, I hate using the word natural, but you know, that's what we are mm-hmm. most adapted to perhaps. Uh-huh. Um, And so trying to kind of like find our way back to that. And and then there's a deep analysis in there of agriculture, the rise of agriculture, the Neolithic transition, the rise of civilization, patriarchy, racism, and and all of those things and how they're intertwined over the last 10,000 years to sort of sum up the sixth mass extinction. So, um, Mm. and how they catalyze those things. So one of the like things that I talk about, you know, one of the things on my myths of prehistory bingo is people are always saying like, um, you know, humans are the cause of the sixth mass extinction, but that's anthropocentric to civilizations, not to humanity. So like the Bushmen, for example, didn't create the sixth mass extinction. Right. And so there's a conflation there that most people, members of civilization have with humanity. Um, And so if we can separate those two things and understand that actually our behavior is influenced greatly by culture and by subsistence, because the way we get our food is very much how the rest of our culture unfolds, 
So it's kind of like looking through all of those things um, and trying to understand essentially environmental psychology, but also how humans fit into ecosystems in a way that is not inherently destructive and how we did for 3 million years of our history, depending on you know how you want to define humans. If you're looking at just Homo sapiens, then it's 150,000 years. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly how to answer that in the sense that I don't know of a lot of specifically feminist authors that have looked at rewilding through one of those avenues or lenses. And again, like I think from my perspective, reading your book, even though it's not labeled as a rewilding book, is something that plugs directly into that examination of what it means to be human and how that's flexible and how some ways create more harm and others create not harm at all, but the opposite of that, which would be like resilience. Interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. Gosh, I wish I could read your whole library of stuff. <laughs> you created this big library of books and information and that's really cool then do you have you do you have a blog too or um, yeah there, i used to have a podcast? blog i i turned it into a book called rewild or die i wrote it in my 20s i don't agree with some of the things i wrote back then i think my perspective on rewilding has changed quite a bit in large part yeah. due to like you know your book and other people's works that have influenced my thoughts on the fluidity and flexibility of what i would call wildness so, you know, I mean, there's the podcast is essentially what I'm doing now. And I teach a class called Rewilding 101. And we kind of go through all this stuff. And there's a lot of reading that's like everything from, you know, academic articles to pop cultural stuff. And then we kind of go through and we'll talk about um, and, and break down those threads, like the one that, you know, essentially that you did in your book. There's one that I have. I read this in my very first class on prehistory. And it's a quote from the book Exploring Prehistory. How Archaeology Reveals Our Past, second edition. It's a, you know, archaeology textbook. And there's a, a section in here about how science and experimentation and and um, the, the scientific literature and data can then be translated into the narratives that then become embodied mythologies in the way that you describe in your book. Mm -hmm. And it's about Dart, the scientist who discovered, who hypothesized that humans evolved in Africa and then also found the first Australopith skulls in Africa in the 50s. Yeah. I'm going to read this to you because it's just, yeah. it's just fascinating, this little bit here. He found all of these skulls in a cave and they were mixed with, it wasn't just Australopith skulls, it was uh, the skulls of some animals as well. And so among the bones were numerous baboon skulls. Dart noted that many of the skulls, as well as six Australopith skulls, bore depressed fractures as if they had been struck on the head. Dart concluded that these fractures must have been caused by violent attacks by the Australopiths and, in the absence of stone artifacts, that the weapon used must have been a large animal bone, possibly an antelope humerus. Examining the bone collection, Dart observed that there was a high proportion of antelope skulls present, but very few neck vertebrae or tailbones. This suggested to him that the game animals had been intentionally decapitated and that the Australopiths were headhunters. Dart reasoned that Australopiths were, quote, confirmed killers, carnivorous creatures that seized living quarry by violence, battered them to death, tore apart their broken bones, dismembered them limb from limb, slaking their ravenous thirst with the hot blood of victims and greedily devouring livid writhing flesh. Dart, 1953. Wow. The idea that the human lineage is innately violent soon penetrated into popular culture. Dart's lurid view of early hominin behavior was popularized by science writer Robert Ardrey in his best-selling book, African Genesis in 1961. Stanley Kubrick's classic 1969, uh, sorry, his 19, classic 1969 film, 2001, A Space Odyssey, opens with a series of violent scenes of club-wielding Australopiths. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you know, when I read that in this, I read this after reading your book, and I was like, here's that thread again that you were talking about. And it's just so, like, awesome orchestrated, or, you know, awesomely put together there. Because what they figured out was that all the skulls in the caves were animals that were being consumed by savanna lions. Mm -hmm. And that's why they didn't have vertebrae or any of the other things. 
The heads were rolling into this cave after the savannah lion was eating them up in a tree. <laughs> but this guy, yeah. you know, grew up in World War II and was a scientist who thought that humans were innately violent and then ended up projecting that idea onto the work that he was doing. Yeah. Wow. How powerful. Yeah. And I swear, I think that that scene that from um, to the 2001 mm -hmm. Space Odyssey film, mm -hmm. that's where I was shown that scene um, in a relationship workshop. <laughs> so that, that's a, yet another use that that film had. And then that's supposed to inform how couples are right. to learn what really causes their conflicts and wow. how to get along better. Wow. I mean, isn't that interesting? Yes. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's just going to keep on going through yeah. the culture. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Well, I'd love to read that. So, yeah. Thanks for coming. Cool. That. So that's fascinating, and um, I really love this this concept of primal anarchy. But mm -hmm. I sort of just want to appropriate it and start a band, and I want to call it primal. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes. A cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I love the primal anarchy cookbook. <laughs> so yes. not to make fun of it i just think no. that's so yeah. that's so great like primal anarchy like that's yeah. it just seems like that would be um that that's that's a concept that would resonate with like multiple generations for different reasons mm -hmm. totally <laughs> so, yes <laughs> so, yeah, yeah i didn't come up with the term um that's you know there's a there's a anarchist named john zerzin and another one named kevin tucker who are sort of the a lot of the um writing and everything around that topic came from them. Ah, yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. I hope to keep in touch and um, hope that uh, I can continue to learn more about rewilding. And I appreciate finding out that um, the caveman mystique and the, the analysis I have in there can, can be part of that rewilding genre. That's oh, yeah. really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much. Rewilding is about rejecting relationships of domination and seeking those of affinity and kinship. Therefore, a rewilding masculinity would be one that rejects the notion that males are inherently violent and that they seek to dominate women, one another, other groups of humans, and the natural world. It would reject the idea that men are inherently anything. It would reject gender essentialism in favor of seeking qualities that feel the most grounded in reciprocity. I appreciate what Martha said in regard to creating a new masculinity that is flexible, fluid, adaptable, playful, and one with grace. I can already see the capitalists out there trademarking the term, the flexible male, as we speak. All potential future co-option aside, I feel this may describe my gender best, and it also perfectly aligns with what it means to rewild, to be adaptable to the ecosystems that we are a part of, in order to continue to fit into the shifting wills of that system, rather than forcing them to adapt to you. I'd like to note here that I'm not a pacifist, nor do I reject any and all use of violence or even wish to make claims that violence isn't a necessary part of existence. I'm interested in knowing how societies minimize and de-escalate violence when it arises. I hope my conversation with Martha has made you think about what rewilding masculinity or gender in general could look like or looks like and feels like to you. If you want to join me down that rabbit hole, I would suggest that your next move would be to read The Caveman Mystique. Check out the podcast notes for links to Dr. McCoy's work and other aspects of our conversation. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to hear more, please become a recurring supporter of my work at petermichaelbauer.com. Thanks for listening.